Hello from Jack Sale. Just uh, Russell here. Wait to for you to come on. Uh, this is our first time um, in this period where we're here on a Wednesday night. Um, as many of you might know, we uh, are here on a Wednesday night normally. Um, but tonight we're doing this with no congregation. So we're just going to wait a few minutes while some people come on. So just give us a few minutes um, while we wait. We don't want to really begin this without those who at least who we know in are coming on live tonight. One, one there watching. Yep. Yeah, we've come got on. three on now. Three there. So we'll just wait a few minutes. Yeah. We'll try and get these up for comments. Um, bear with us as we do this. We're trying to do it from all sorts of angles, both on the phone, so we can see comments coming in um, and please do that put your comments on and we'll try to if they are a uh, yes yeah, so we've got another one going on here we need to turn the volume now so it doesn't echo yeah and we'll maybe i'll see the comments Hopefully, yeah. um, if you are on if you want to say hello and then we can probably see that you're on yeah we've got there's that, five people that, on that, the minute so. Great. so you could just say hello if you've come online That'll help, Sue. Hi, Sue. Oh, that's that better. Russ, we'll see you here as well. Can you see that? Yeah, I can see yeah. that. Yeah. Hi, Sue. Dale. Um, God bless you, Sue. Good to see you. Neil Burton, bless you. Neil. Uh, say hello to Lewis. Hi, Lewis. Yes. Okay. We'll give it another minute or so, and then we'll uh, we'll pray. Can't hear. You can't hear. Can, can just just confirm anybody who's on if you can actually hear or not, because obviously we'll need to work that out. If not, can you can you hear us? Just put a comment on just to say that you can hear us or not. Hi Jan, no doubt that is Jan and Paul. Craig, hi. You can hear. Sue can hear. So that means hi Annette. That means, we, that means that the microphone is working. Hi, Annette. Great stuff. Brilliant volume low. That's probably your, your end, uh, Neil, might be your end. So just try your, your end. Yeah, Dale can hear. So okay. Dale, is it, is it, is it uh, loud enough on your end? Annette, thank you. Brilliant. You can hear us. Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Volume's good for me. Okay. That's good news. Good. Okay, I'm going to um, just pray why people come on, otherwise we could be waiting all night. I'm going to pray, and then I'm just going to give you a, a bit of a, a one or two minute introduction on why we're doing this, uh, and then Russell's going to begin. And like I've said already, please, please comment, put your comments on, and uh, let it be for edification, as if we were here together. Let us edify one another. This is going to be a difficult time as we do this. So let us uh, edify one another, okay? Hi, Linda. Good to see you online. Right, I'm going to pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. I thank you for this opportunity. Though it's strange sitting this side of the camera, and no doubt it is sitting that side of the camera. But Lord, we do this that we might, in this time, this time of real challenge this time which is without doubt strange but we know that within this time you remain absolutely sovereign that you are good that you're faithful so lord tonight as we do this i ask that your spirit will enable us to do so as we read and as we refer to your scriptures as we pray and encourage one another let it be for to the praise and the glory of your name to the edification of your people that we might grow in grace that we might walk in your ways father god tonight i ask for your church in this land that you'll strengthen it Father God, that we will um, become a prayerful, prayerful people. Once again, we, have, we want to ask you tonight, Lord, to forgive us. We repent, Lord, of our sin. We repent of, of forsaking that which was good and, and going our own way. And Lord, we come to you tonight asking that you'll forgive us. And we ask you, Lord, that you'll look upon us in grace and in favour. Father, we ask that your church would repent and turn from its ways. Father, a nation, Lord, we ask for our government, we ask for our... Uh, government who, who leaders there Lord that you will cause repentance to come and quicken them by your spirit but Lord as we open the pages of your precious word tonight we ask that the spirit would help us and that we would have ears to hear 
what you're saying. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, so tonight we are going to read, begin reading um, from this book. We're going to use this as a guide for as long as we, we do this, unless the Lord says different. We're going to use this as a guide to go through the attributes of God. For those of you who are amongst us know very well that uh, over the last months now, probably since Christmas, we have been going through the attributes of God on a Wednesday night. We've discussed his faithfulness. Uh, his aseity, that meaning his self-existence. We've discussed his sovereignty, but in two parts I had covered that. We spoke of his sovereignty in creation, in providence and in salvation. Uh, Russell dealt with the nobility of God. We've been going through this. And the reason we felt that the Lord was showing us to do this is because we are convinced here that the church doesn't know God. That all we get now on a Sunday across our nation in churches are 20 minute homilies. We hear nothing of repentance. We hear nothing of um, holiness. And I believe, along with Russell here, we believe that we, the nation, the church, have forsaken God. And all we see now is a gospel of humanism. And what we need to get back to is knowing God. That we might know him, Paul says. We, want it, we need to know him. We need to know his attributes. We need to know who he is. So we encourage you tonight to partake in this, however this will go. To study the word. To be eager. To do your utmost. And by his spirit, that he will lead us into all truth. I'm going to hand over to Russell, who is going to be our reader. Uh, no doubt he'll stop and comment at any point. I will come in where I feel led and necessary. Um, and please, again, you're online make comment, ask questions, but I ask again, it will be for the good and the edification of one another. All right, here goes. Okay, thanks. I'm going to read, uh, we're going to read uh, this book that Ryan introduced, The Attributes of God by A.W. Pink. I'm going to start from chapter one. Uh, there's about 24 chapters, so depending on how long uh, we, we're doing this, we will try and get through them all. Uh, but as Ryan said, I think with regards to asking questions, obviously on a Wednesday night we usually do have the contributions, etc. Um, but obviously, with the time that we have, etc., we, we, we might not be able to ad answer or deal with every question, but put them on, and we'll see where we go, and if there's any in particular that you want us to deal with, we'll probably make a note of them and try and answer them at another time, okay? So this one, this week, is going to be, and if I say this right, the solitariness of God, the solitariness of God, which really is... Um, it's taken from the word solitary. So I think from that word we're kind of going to know where we're going. So I'm going to begin to read. Um, and I will stop and make some comments as I feel I ought to. Okay, so we, uh, we begin with the, the first chapter. The title of this article is perhaps not sufficiently explicit to indicate its theme. This is partly due to the fact that so few today are accustomed to meditate upon the personal perfections of God. Comparatively few of those who occasionally read the Bible are aware of the awe-inspiring and worship-provoking grandeur of the divine character. So Ryan's already kind of said this, but as he says here, this is partly due to the fact so few, this, this is A.W. Pink who's speaking in, I'm not sure entirely, but I think he might, may have died in the mid 1950s I think but I think he was born in the late 1800s so he's still speaking quite quite a number of years ago and he's talking about the fact that there is comparatively few people who even occasionally read the Bible are aware of the awe-inspiring and worship-provoking grandeur of his divine character and how many of us meditate upon the personal perfections of God it's an interesting question it's easy to read things, it's easy to think about them for a few minutes, but how often do we spend our time personally just contemplating upon the character of God? That God in great wisdom, I carry on, that God in great wisdom, wondrous in power, yet full of mercy, is assumed by many to be almost common knowledge. But to entertain anything approaching an adequate conception of his being, his nature and his attributes, as these are revealed in Holy Scripture, is something which very, very few people 
in these degenerate times have attained unto. God is solitary in his excellency. So again we see there, don't we, that very few, A.W. Pink is bringing out the fact that there are very, very few people who live in these degenerate times who, who think upon, even though it's common knowledge, we have this common knowledge that, that God is, there's a common knowledge of, of the belief of God, you know, there's a common acceptance of God, and I think that's getting less and less in today's generation, but there is still a common accept, acceptation of God, and the concept of his being, as it says here, and his nature and his attributes. But we live in times that are degenerate, and we don't have many people who spend a lot of time thinking into these things. Can I just say, I mean, one of the points that Pink's making here, and this is, this is often the discussion amongst us, and I think one of the things that, uh, how, would I, how would I term it, kind of causes me to lament is how many Christians, or so-called Christians, do not have any relationship with the Word of God. They don't, they don't read it, they don't, they don't think that it's there to be read, they just see that it's something that they at best bring with them when they go to church. And I think that, for me, when you speak and when you hear so-called preachers, pastors in pulpits, what we hear now, and I think this in part is what Pink is saying, we don't hear these things anymore. And we feel that we need to see these great doctrines re-established in his church. So it says, again, a statement that says, God is solitary in his excellency. So when you think of the word solitary, you think of yourself as being on your own. If I'm solitary, I'm by myself. So by himself, as a being himself, he is excellent. Now in this book, it tends to quote most of the scriptures and then give the reference, but I'm going to try and give the reference first before I read into them. So if you have a Bible and you want to, uh, you can turn to them. So after this quote of God is solitary in his excellency, we have a scripture from Exodus 15, verse 11. That's Exodus 15, verse 11. And let's just look at this, what Darren's put before we go read that scripture. Darren just put, the further we get away from the cross, the less concerned about the things of God. That's very true. I would think that we, we would say that the further we get away, we get to a place where we actually become numb towards these things. And so Exodus 50, verse 11, 15, sorry, verse 11 says... Who is like unto you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? That's Exodus 15, verse 11. Who is like unto you? There is no one like unto God. And he even says, among the gods. Glorious, holy, fearful in praises and doing wonders. Now that's giving an example of the excellency of God. In the beginning, we go on to the next paragraph. In the beginning, God. And he stops there. In the beginning, God. Genesis 1, verse 1. He goes on to say, There was a time, if time it could be called, when God, in the unity of his nature, though subsisting equally in three divine persons, dwelt alone. In the beginning, God. There was no heaven where his glory is now particularly manifested. There was no earth to engage his attention. There were no angels to hymn his praises. No universe to be upheld by the power, uh, sorry, the word of his power. There was nothing, no one but God. And that's not for a day, a year, or an age but from everlasting. I think that's a really interesting paragraph, you know, because when I first read this, I thought, I, I, I don't think that I ever, or often at least, think of things in this way. That in the beginning, there was no heaven. You know, God made heaven as a place to dwell and a place for us and for his angels to dwell. So before, 
before that, before he created anything, there was no heaven. There was no heaven. There was no earth. No angels. No universe. Nothing to uh, kind of consider himself about in a sense. There was nothing and no one but God. And, not, and that not only for a day or a year or an age, but from everlasting. And then it says, during eternity past, God was alone. Self-contained. Self-sufficient. Which we dealt with and probably will do in the aseity. Self-satisfied. In need of nothing. Had a universe, had angels, had human beings been necessary to him in any way, they also had been called into existence from all eternity. The creating of them when he did added nothing to God, essentially. He changes not. That's Malachi 3 verse 6. you want to turn to that? Have a yeah. look at what that says. Malachi 3 verse 6, it says he changes not. But let's see what else it says. But do we often think about these things, you know? He is of himself completely happy, if you like. He doesn't need anybody or, or anything. He doesn't need the angels to worship him. He doesn't need a world to look after. And he says here that the creating of all these things added nothing to God essentially. I think that's an interesting thing. So Malachi 3 verse 6. Yeah, it says really what you quote with, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. He changes not. It says after this Malachi 3 verse 6 in the book, it says, Therefore his essential glory can be neither augmented nor diminished. And now I had a look up at the word augmented because... I wasn't sure myself what it meant. But what augmented means is to be made greater in size or value. So basically it's saying that his essential glory can't be made greater, it can't be made bigger, it can't, be, um, it can't become any more valuable than it is, and it can't, neither can it be diminished in its size or its power or its value. So it can't change. Nothing changes about God at all in any way. From the beginning of the earth, even before anything was created, until now, God is still the same. What's Darren put there? There is no shadow of changing. With the, uh, I think it says shadow of turning, doesn't it? But it, I think it means the same. Any, have you got any comments you want to make before I go on to the next? No, no, go, go on. Next paragraph. God was under no constraint. This is an interesting paragraph, so listen carefully to this. God was under no constraint, no obligation, no necessity to create. Just stop there a second. Let you have a think about that one. God was under no constraint. What's constraint mean? Basically, nobody got God's arm around his back, twisted his arm and said, you must do this. To be constrained is to have a force making you do something. He wasn't under any constraint to create the world, or people, or animals, or anything that there is. He was under no obligation. He wasn't obliged to do anything for anybody. And there was no necessity to create. So it wasn't as though you know, God was needy all of a sudden, you know, or he was bored, or he just felt like he needed some company. Uh, you know... I think I've heard people say that, you know, God wanted to create people so we could have a relationship with them. And that is true. God does want to have a relationship with people. That is absolutely spot on. But when we talk about the necessity, it isn't a necessity. God doesn't of necessity need a relationship with anybody mm. or his creatures. Yeah. There is no, no, he hasn't, if he, if he had a need for any kind of relationship, then you, you're looking at, a hole in God that needs to be filled. And God has no holes to be filled. So I'll carry on unless you've got anything to no, add to keep that. going. Okay, I'll just read that bit again because it's just part of the first paragraph and it'll just make more sense to carry, carry on with it. God was under no constraint, no obligation and no necessity to create. 
that he chose to do so was purely a sovereign act on his part, caused by nothing outside himself, determined by nothing but his own mere good pleasure. For, and it quotes Ephesians 1 verse 11, for he works all things after the counsel of his own will. Again, it's kind of saying the same thing. Nothing caused him to do this. Nothing determined him to do this. Only his own good pleasure, as it says in Ephesians 1 verse 11, that he works all things after the counsel of his own will. His good pleasure, merely because it pleased him to do so. That he did create was simply for his manifest manifestative glory. That's, a, that's an interesting statement as well. People will say, why did, God, you know, why did God create the earth? Why did he create us? Why did he do this? What was the point of it all? One simple sentence there. He did this to manifest his glory. That is it. Now, it's not it in the whole grand scheme of things because for us to understand his man manifestative glory, it's going to take us an eternity. But he did it to manifest his own glory. Then A.W. Pink asked a question. And this is a question that you maybe we could ask ourselves in the things that we've read. Do some of our readers imagine that we have gone beyond what scripture warrants? So he's asking the question, with all these things that we're saying, with all the things that we've said thus far, are we going beyond what scripture says? So then he says, our appeal shall be to the law and the testimony. So we're talking about the Old Testament initially here. And the scripture quoted, if you want to turn to it, is Nehemiah 9 verse 5. There's a scripture here quoted from Nehemiah 9 verse 5. I'll just give you a second to, to find that, if you're going to find that. Just see who's online now. Ernesto Santos, welcome. Daryl Clark, Paul Sutcliffe, Brenda, hi Brenda. Good to see you all online. Really good. Nehemiah 9 5. Yeah, Nehemiah 9, 9 5. Do you want to read it from your yeah. Bible? Then the Levites, Jeshua and Cadmiel, then I, Hashbiniah, Sherebiah, Hodajai, Shebaniah, and Pethiah, said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. And blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Just one second. David, David Rawson, am I the only one struggling to hear? There was one other that said that uh, they were struggling to hear. Um, but most people have said that they're hearing fine, so it possibly could be something on your own device. So try, try turning up your own device. Could be louder. Brenda Renshaw could be louder. We've got the, um, the camera really as close as we can get without it kind of taking us out of focus, I think. We would try and um, speak a bit louder, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, it should be fine because we've got an external microphone in there as well, so it shouldn't really be an issue with volume, I wouldn't think. Can you just, just all try and, and turn up the volume of your own devices because that, that could be part of the problem. Phone okay, laptop not. Yeah, laptops are sometimes their volume, depending on the age of it, may not be that great anyway. Yeah, thanks Lewis, appreciate that. Hi Chris. Darren says it's fine with, the, fine with the headphones in. Dale says volume's fine. Sound setting, sound in the setting should be on full volume for everything. Headphones make it better. Okay, well, this is a this is trial and error. Yeah. Um, so you're gonna have to bear with us. This is uh, our first time, in a way, doing this while while the congregation are on. And just let me say this: it's great to see the names that are coming on here. Um, wonderful, hi Liz. Volume fine for me. Thanks, Chris. Hi, Chris. What we're gonna do without your contributions tonight? Eh? Really struggling. Sorry about that, David. 
Um, have you got any headphones, David, to try? Yeah, try some headphones if you've got them, David. Yeah, we'll, we'll press on with the wires. Yeah, so. So we've read that in Nehemiah 9, 5, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever, and blessed be thy glorious name, which exalted above all blessing and praise. So I think the previous statement, the previous statements that we've been saying is that, that, that God is under no obligation to create. He chose to do this uh, under his sovereign will to manifest his glory. And then it asked the question, do some readers imagine that we have gone beyond scripture warrants? And so we read this verse. And the point in phrase really is at the end there. It says that God is exalted above all blessing and praise. So he's saying that he is actually above blessing and praise. It says afterwards, God is no gainer even from our worship. So again what we're trying to say here is this is not about saying that worship's not vital, worship's not part of our, our life. It is, majorly, majorly so. But what we're saying is that this is not eff effective to God. It doesn't change who he is, it's not a need that he has. It says God is no gainer, even from our worship. He was in no need of that external glory of his grace which arises from his redeemed. He doesn't need it, is what we say. Here. Yeah, I think, I think what's trying to be said here, and the language is difficult, to, I felt, when I was reading this. But I think in its simplicity, what it's saying is, is you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking out loud here when, when Jesus said, if, these, if you don't worship me, these stones will worship me. Our worship doesn't add to who he is, nor not worshipping him does, he, does it take away from who he is, nor does it affect him in that which he does or doesn't do, for he is absolute in all that he is. Um, so, yes, I, I think that's what's being said. God is no gainer, even from our worship. That doesn't, that doesn't mean it doesn't please him. It pleases him. He's called us to worship. He, he, he hears the prayers of his people. He, he accepts the worship of his people. But what is being said is it doesn't add to who he is, essentially who he is. Remember, we're talking about the attributes of God and who he is. Our worship doesn't affect or defect or decrease, add to or take away who he is in essence. I think that's what Pink's trying yeah, to say. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Dale says, our worship makes him no more or no less. He is God. That's, that's, that's it. That's, that's, yeah. I mean, that Dale really is putting it in, a, in its uh, simplicity. And I, think, I think what Liz has said here, Liz Randall, worship is our connection yeah. with the Most High. Yeah. God has given us this great pleasure, this great way of communication. We, we who are born again have that, that heart that now wants to give him worship. So again, it's one of his graces for us, you know. He's given it us, and it is a connection, if you like. I think we could use, find a better word, but I think it's a relational thing, actually. It's, it, it, it's, it's a relationship thing. We want to worship him because he is our all, he is our saviour. So I think with this, this, I think, if I'm being honest with you, this paragraph, as I read this, I read this a few times, as you might guess, I think it, it, it can have an essence of negativity. But I think what has been said, and what the, what's being said here is, um, as Darren's put, he, his being demands worship, but it does not add one thing to his being. That's See. good. And I think that that's what makes this understood. Like Ryan was saying, if you need to read this, if you've got the book, you need to read this a couple of times to see yeah. that it's not saying anything against worship. He's just talking about the very essence of who God is and what, what he needs and doesn't need, if you know what I mean. He doesn't need anything. That's what he's trying to say. Yeah, Even the worship. So sorry. Let's not misinterpret that worship no. is, is not needed. Worship is commanded. He, he wants to worship. It benefits us to worship him. Does and that is saying that's, that's right. We are beneficiaries of worshiping him. I think it goes um, on to say that as well. So. It will, yeah. Let us pre let's just press, on. press on. But uh, it's important to talk about these things like this. I'll just read that that little bit again because it goes on uh, without finishing the sentence. God is no gainer even from our worship. He was in no need of that external glory of His grace, which arises from His redeemed. For He is glorious enough in Himself. Without that, that's the that's the point we're making. He is glorious yes. enough in himself without the need of worship. 
Yeah, I think, again, just opening the conversation, I think that, again, the gospel of today kind of, we're like gifts to God. We, we, it's like there's a God in heaven who desperately weans and weeps after us in the sense of he needs us to, have to, to add to who he is. But he is, is, as Chris has put, God is perfect in all things. You can't add anything to his perfection. That is what's being said here. And I think it, sometimes, I think today's modern gospel is like we are the icing on the cake for God. And though he finds great pleasure in us, God is who he is. And we, in many ways, add nothing to who he is. It just because, as it's said so, it's repeated in this. Why did he do all this? Because it pleased him. And then we go on to say, it says this again, what Ryan's just said, there's a question. This is what um, A.W. Pink asks. What was it that moved him to predestinate his elect to the glory of his grace? What was it? Yeah. And it says, it was, as Ephesians 1 verse 5 tells us, That's right. according to the good pleasure of his will. That's it. That's the end of it. You know, we, 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 we can often try too much to go into things that scripture doesn't tell us. Why us? Why me? Why you? Why, why the world? Because it is according to the good pleasure of his will. And as it said earlier, and I think it was Ephesians 1 verse 11, that he works all things after the counsel of his own will. That, that's it. That's our answer. And that's the answer that we should stay with. And that's the answer that we should be content with as well. Leanne Smith, we have to worship God because he is God. Amen. Worship is a way of life, not only singing and praising God on a Sunday. Worshipping God is everywhere in our hearts. Amen. Yeah, well done. Great stuff, Leanne. Thank you for that. Okay, I'll carry on in the next paragraph. We are well aware that the high ground we are here treading is new and strange to almost all of our readers. For that reason, it is well to move slowly. Let our appeal again be to the scriptures. At the end of Romans 11, where the apostle brings to a close his argument on salvation by pure and sovereign grace, he asks, For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Or who has first given to him that it should be recompensed unto him again? Verses 34 and 35 of Romans 11. The force, of this, the force of this is, it is impossible to bring the Almighty under obligations to the creature. God gains nothing from us. If you are righteous, what do you give to him? Or what does he receive from your hand? Your wickedness affects only a man like yourself, and your righteousness only the sons of men. That's from Job 35 verse 7 and 8 I'll read it again if you are righteous what do you give to him or what does he receive from your hand your wickedness affects only a man like yourself and your righteousness only the sons of men that's Job 35 verse 7 to 8 goes on to say but it certainly cannot affect God who is all blessed in himself Luke 17, verse 10, says this, So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. That's an important piece of scripture. Because we can, if we're not careful, we can start to lend the things that we do. Let's just, let's just say what we're doing here tonight. We can start to take things like this as being something that we can put in our scales to weigh what we've done for God. When in fact, really, all that we're doing here tonight, you, me, together as a church, all we're doing really is our duty. We're not doing anything that, 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 that whatever we're doing tonight, we're not suddenly, there, God's not suddenly in our debt because we've done him some favour. We're only doing our duty and nothing more. A.W. Pink goes on to say, Nay, we go further. And this is going to be something else we need to understand and get right. 
Nay, we go further. Our Lord Jesus Christ added nothing to God in his essential being and glory, either by what he did or suffered. True, blessedly and gloriously true, he manifested the glory of God to us, but he added nothing to God. He himself expressly declares so, and there is no appeal from his words taken from Psalm 16 verse 2, my goodness extends not to you. Do you want to get that up and see if it says any more? 16 verse 2, Psalm 16 verse 2. Hi, Mark Dooley. Welcome. Psalm 16. O oh my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee. It says about Psalm 16, The whole of that psalm is a psalm of Christ. Christ's goodness or righteousness reached unto his saints in the earth, which it says in verse 3. Have a look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, But to the saints that are in the earth, and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. So the whole of the psalm is a psalm of Christ. Christ's goodness or righteousness reached unto his saints in the earth, verse 3. But God was high above and beyond it all. That's what he's saying about even Christ himself, who is essentially God. But God was high above it all, beyond it all. God alone, Mark, 6, uh, sorry, Mark 14, verse 61, God alone is the blessed one. God alone is the blessed one. If you've got this book, it might be um, really worth having a read through this whole chapter. But, you know, when we get to paragraphs like that, it's good to go over it and understand what it's saying, you know, rather than just hearing it and thinking, what, what, you know. I think we've got to take here in context all the other attributes that we've been studying, yeah. who he is in his profoundness. That he's, you know, God, let's think of, I don't know if we've covered, I can't remember if we've covered this, but he's, God is eternal, the eternity of God. So this, this, this redemptive plan was set out before the foundation of the earth. And God, in essence, is eternal. He is, he is faithful. He is sovereign. He is, um, he is all these things. He is patient. He is merciful. He is loving. He is all these things. He is, he is, he is blessing. He is cursed. He gives curses. He, 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 the cursings of God. He's done all these things. So, the time that Christ came and died is not added to God because it is His redemptive plan. On the very foundation of the earth. We seem to um, think of these things in a chronological order. Where God decreed them. Which is our next subject. From the very beginning. Yeah exactly. And I think you know the scripture says that. God the Father and God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. And all in essence God. They are God in three persons. And so everything that was um, in that council of their will. Before the foundation of the earth. Was still within their essence. It wasn't outside, it wasn't before, it wasn't after. And so the fact that it's been, in a sense, in time for us, outplayed or shown in time, doesn't add anything to what already was and already is. It's important to know that. Just want to read what Rachel said. God always acts first. Our worship is due to him and it's impossible to overpay. He will always be due more than we can ever give. True. The scripture says that we love God because he first loved us. And so we can't overpay, as has already been said. We are only ever doing our duty. And that's it. Okay, I'll go on to the next paragraph. And it says this. It is perfectly true that God is both honoured and dishonoured by men. Not in his essential being, but in his official character. I think that's what we're trying to say there. Not in his essential being, but in his official character. It is equally true that God has been glorified by creation, by providence, and by redemption. This we do not and dare not dispute for a moment. But all of this has to do with his manifest glory and the recognition of it by us. I think that is the vital point. 
in, in much of what we've just read. That all of it has to do with his manifest glory and the recognition of it by his people. Yeah. It's, it's a real, as you sit here thinking about it, 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 it's beyond us. I mean, he is complete glory. He is absolute. So how can you add to that which is, it's already been said on the comments, that which is perfect. It can't, nothing changes his character in any way. No. So the work of the cross was decreed by him, planned by him, um, fulfilled in him, because it came out of him. Because salvation is of the law, therefore it doesn't add to him, because it is him. And the fact of the matter is, like we've already said, that before the foundation of the earth, before anything was created, before heaven was created, before angels were created, before anything was, God was completely and utterly um, self-sufficient, happy in, his, in the company of the three persons. And so to say that anything else after that adds to him is saying that, as, as I said earlier, there, there was some kind of hole in God that needed to be filled, and that is absolutely uh, untrue. I just looked to where, where, we, where we got to. We got where it is perfectly true that God both yep. honoured and dishonoured by men. Yeah, we've, so we read that bit. So it says, it says next, but yet had God so pleased, he might have continued alone for all eternity without making known his glory unto creatures. Whether he should do so or not was determined solely by his own will. He was perfectly blessed in himself before the first creature was called into being. And what are all the creatures of his hands unto him even now? Let scripture again make an answer. So I've got a scripture here, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 15 through 18. I'll let you read that if you, if you want to read it from there. Yeah. Not sure what uh, he uses in here. Isaiah 40. Yeah, Isaiah 40, 15 through 18. Yeah, this is good, this. Okay. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing. And they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. To whom then will ye liken God? Or what likeness, likeness will ye compare to him? Where it says um, the nations are as nothing. That doesn't mean he doesn't care. But their wisdom, their power, do not compare to his. We are, they're nothing compared to his. The, the very fact that the, the, the scripture tells us that everything coheres together through the power of the Son of God tells us that like if, 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 if I had created something and, and that something only uh, lived and moved and had its being because I gave it its power, I gave it the ability to do what it was doing, then if all of that came from me anyway, then what then can that add to me if it comes from me? Yeah. That's what it's trying to say. Because whatever that is, is already within me. So it can't add anything to me. Yeah. So when it says these things are as nothing, it, it's like Rice, it's not saying he doesn't care about it. It's saying that it, it, at the very end of things, what, what, what image will you compare him to? What, how are you going to, to... To whom will you compare God? You can't measure him up with anything of our own imagining. That is the God of Scripture. That's what it says next. That is the God of Scripture. Alas, he is still the unknown God of Acts 17, 23. He is still the unknown God to the heedless multitudes. Let's have a look at the comment. God is God without us. This should humble any man who thinks above his station. Yeah, very true. It's important that you know, God is God with or without us. And I think, though, though we're reading paragraphs after paragraphs and, and fighting through what 
some of these things might mean. Um, God is God, with you or without you. He is mighty, he is, he is awesome in power, and all the attributes that we'll go on to look on from here, and have done for, for some weeks, as you know, we'll come to the same conclusion. What can we add to his stature? What, what can we add? The answer is nothing. Because all things exist and coexist and are maintained by him. Therefore, nothing can change who he is because he is. That's what he said to Moses. Who do I say you sent me? We say this in, in most of the attributes that we've discussed over the, the last few months. I tell them, I am sent you. I am what I am. Um, amazing. Yeah. I was just thinking about the, uh, it's probably a bit of a silly example really, but I was thinking about the question that's asked sometimes is, um, if a tree falls in the forest and there's nobody around to hear it, is there still a noise? Because nobody hears it. And, and of course there is. The answer is of course there is a noise. And so the fact of the matter is that it, if nobody is around, we, what we don't, because of our cognition or our recognition that there is a God, that doesn't make, make the fact that there is a God because we recognise that fact. Without even one man ever existing, God is still God. And that's what Dan was just said. Okay, let's carry on. Time's going quickly already. Yes. Okay, it says next, his, his throne, he, sorry, he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. That is Isaiah 40, 22 and 23. How vastly different is the God of Scripture from the God of the average pulpit? What a statement. Yeah. What a statement. That's something that you could actually stand in the pulpit and preach about. But we won't do that tonight. Nor is the testimony of the New Testament any different from that of the Old how could it be, seeing that both one, sorry, both have one and the same author? There do we read in 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16, 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honour and might forever. Amen. Such an one is to be revered, worshipped and adored. He is solitary in his majesty, unique in his excellency, peerless in his perfections. He sustains all, but is himself independent of all. He gives to all, but it is enriched by none. Great statement. Such a God cannot be found out by searching. He can be known only as he is revealed to the heart by the Holy Spirit through the Word. Very important. Very important statement. Let me just read that again. Such a God cannot be found out by searching. He can only be known as he is revealed to the heart by the Holy Spirit through the Word. It is true that creation demonstrates a creator so plainly that men are without excuse. Yet we still have to say with Job, Lo, these are parts of his ways, but how little a portion is heard of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? Job 26 verse 14. The so-called argument from design by well-meaning apologists has, we believe, done much more harm than good, for it has attempted to bring down the great God to the level of finite comprehension, and thereby has lost sight of his solitary excellence. Analogy has been drawn between a savage finding a watch upon the sands, and from a close examination of it he infers a watchmaker. So far so good. But attempt to go further, Suppose that savage sits down on the sand and endeavours to form to himself a conception of this watchmaker, his personal affections and manners, his disposition, acquirements and moral character. All that goes to make up a personality. Could he ever think 
or reason out a real man. The man who made the watch so that he could say, I am acquainted with him. It seems trifling to ask such questions. But is the eternal and infinite God so much more within the grasp of human reason? No, indeed. The God of Scripture can only be known by those to whom he makes himself known. Nor is God known by the intellect. God is spirit, as it tells us in John 4.24, and therefore can only be known spiritually. But man is not spiritual. He is carnal. He is dead to all that is spiritual unless he is born again. Supernaturally brought from death unto life, miraculously translated out of darkness into light, he cannot even see the things of God, John 3 verse 3, still less apprehend them. 1 Corinthians 2.14 The Holy Spirit has to shine in our hearts, not our intellects, in order to give us the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 4.6. And even that spiritual knowledge is but fragmentary. The regenerated soul has to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, 2 Peter 3.18. The principal prayer and aim of Christians should be that we walk worthy of the law unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, which is Colossians 1, verse 10. And that is the end of that chapter. Quite a lot. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. yeah, if you've got anything more you want to say on that, it's a, you know, it's, it's a huge topic, and it really is introductory to the book, really. Um, as we go on, we're going to be looking at the decrees of God next week. Um, the one thing I want to say about this, and we say often, the God of Scripture can only be known by those to whom he makes himself known. The Scriptures are very clear that unless God intervenes, we lie dead in our sin. Ephesians 2 verse 1 says that it is he that hath quickened you. It is he who makes you alive. It is he who does the work. We are dead in our sin. We had no hope. We had as much hope as that man who looked, who found the watch, trying to describe the personality and the characteristics and the knowing of the man who made the watch, though he had never met him. It's not possible. So, in all of this, in all the attributes of God, what, what it comes up and finishes with this is a, uh, the humility of God in condescending, who made himself in the likeness of man. Jesus Christ came and he died in order to save sinners. What a wonderful gospel that we, we, we serve and, and, and by God's help we preach. And as we do this, I want to say to you tonight we could have picked up on what's going on around us and why we're having to do it in this way. But we have to keep focus. We have to make sure that in these times of real trial and strangeness and I've had many conversations, much thought about what is really going on. We have to keep our eyes upon Christ. Amen. So as we do these things, as we, as we read through these things, I want to encourage you tonight, those of you who are amongst us here at Jacksdale Southside Community Church, and anybody else who might be watching, give yourself wholly to the word of God and prayer. Next week, by God's grace, we'll look at the decrees of God. This is something we've been looking to look at for a long time with one thing or another so we, chapter two next week god willing we'll look at the decrees of god if you've got this book have a read through um, if you haven't you can find it online as pdf versions etc etc so you can read through it uh, ready to uh, to jump on next week to join us all together and to to be prepared so that we can read these things together yeah i'll just quickly comment lewis yeah james 4 8 Submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep, let your laughter be turned into mourning. I mean, I, I, um, I imagine you're talking about how we come to him, as I was commenting on that the, God must intervene. We are, as it says so often in the, 
New Testament, and definitely does. I think Ezekiel 37 has been mentioned. Dry bones. We are like bones in a valley with no hope. We need the breath of God to breathe on us, uh, Lewis. And this letter James is, is, is writing, is speaking to Christians. We yeah. must live. My brethren. My brethren. James, a servant of God and the, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptation. This, and we miss this throughout all the epistles. This are, these are writing to the Christians. And you're right to, to ask the question, but this is, this is a continual call for Christians to continue in repentance. We must continue in repentance and we must submit ourselves to him. That there is not talking about the, the unregenerate becoming alive by what, one, what that person might do, but it's an encouragement, a command to continue in repentance. Would you agree with us? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I was thinking it when I was looking at the comments, but you beat me to it. So yeah, it's important worries. to note we cannot, um, we cannot do this of ourselves. Dead men don't do anything. They need to be quickened, revived, and made alive. Okay, let us um, finish in prayer. Thanks for joining us tonight. It's uh, certainly a, a new way of doing things. I confess I'd rather you all be here uh, and in better communication. Uh, body language and all sorts is always better than trying to do it over the internet. But this is what we have as we were praying before. Me and Russell were praying before that this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And I'm sure as these weeks go on, who knows how long it will be. We'll have got used to it. We'll have got used to it. You'll have got used to it. And then we'll be allowed to have uh, those gatherings again. Yeah, so let's, let's just say this just before I praise. Let's just thank God, even though we, we would rather be together. And, you know, looking at these empty seats here tonight, is, it does bring a little bit of a pang to your heart. And I wish that everybody was together and we could talk about these things. Nevertheless, God has put us in a time where we have such, such technology that we can do this. And, and, I, and I think that although this is uh, something that we would like to, to do as a secondary thing, um, we do need to thank God for it. And it has been really good to, to be on here with you all commenting and listening. And, uh, so let's thank God for that as well. Hallelujah. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. And his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counsellor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Father, we ask tonight, that as we've read the pages of this book, but more importantly, as we've read and referred to the great Pages of your scripture, I ask you, Lord, that you'll cause a blessing to be upon your people. Father God, whether that be of this local church here or those who have come in from other places and other churches, we ask you, Lord, that you'll bless these precious people, that your name will be glorified in their lives. Father God, that we would walk in your ways, that you'd fill us with your spirit, that you'll cause us to walk in your way, that we'll live a life unto holiness, that we'll live a life in repentance, we'll live a life of joy, and we'll live a life, Lord, where we have assurance of our salvation. Lord, may your people tonight be blessed, and may we go on to the praise and the glory of your great name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. And um, Sunday, we will be here, God willing. Uh, I'll be speaking about that, actually. James 4, 13 through to 17. What is your life? Um, we will be doing this from the pulpit. Myself and Russell will be here, um, God willing, to go live. It won't be in this format. There'll be, um, you can comment, but we won't be answering questions. We're going to be preaching the word of God. We're going to break bread together. So we aim, and I trust you'll listen to this church, those of you who are amongst us, uh, we'll aim to begin by half past ten, we'll go live. Um, I would advise you, if you can, with your families, be prepared to break bread. We're going to try over the Facebook Live here, we're going to break bread together and give God the thanks until we meet again. So let's encourage one another to do that. So be prepared, if you can, to break bread with us. We're going to do that um, together. Thanks for tuning in. Linda, Sue, Craig, Liz, Lewis, Darren, Chris, and many more. God bless you all.
See you soon. Amen. Take care. Bye for now.